keeping on my Oprah glasses. Just I to, love them. Just in case Oprah joins, she'll know that I want it to be like her. <laughs> uh, so Casey, if you want to start, I guess, letting folks in. Yeah, let's do it. Um, yeah, and we can kind of plan, I guess, to get, get kicked off at, at about the, the six after. Very cool. Give them, welcome the folks in when they get here. Hello, hello, welcome, welcome. We're gonna give folks a little bit of little bit of time to to catch up here and and uh, join, uh, but I'd like to shout out and welcome Daryl and Sally. I see you out there. Appreciate y'all. Mike Gibbons, Marsha. Hey, hey, yeah. <laughs> great, great. Jeff and Charlotte, good to see you. Miss Connie, thank you, thank you for joining, and and hope hope to hear uh, hear hear you chime in occasionally too, because uh, you're always an inspiration. Uh, Angel, great to see you. Warren. Indeed, indeed. Good to see Sheila, Sheila Lodge, former mayor of Santa Barbara. Uh, Courtney Woodyard, family from the East Coast. Glad to see him there. <laughs> Retired, I believe, sergeant in the army. I think that's the rank he retired at. Give it about two more minutes here. Let folks continue to trickle in. Uh, we've got a good crowd here. We had quite a few folks who had RSVP, which is always a pleasure. Uh, and then we'll let, let Casey kind of get, get us all oriented here as, as she's been uh, helping out a lot with, with keeping me oriented uh, as we, we do a, a flurry of activities uh, throughout the past uh, few months. <laughs> Mike Gibbons always covering my six there. Uh, yeah, I'll give a shout out to my sister, Malia. Pleasure. <laughs> a recent transplant, Keith. Keith, recent transplant from Oakland. Welcome, welcome. Casey, we can probably go ahead, go ahead and get, get started if you're ready. ready. Super. Well, good evening. It's just wonderful to have all of you with us tonight. Uh, thank you for joining us. And um, we'll continue letting other friends in as they join us uh, over the next few minutes. My name is Casey Rogers. I'm a supporter of Coffee with a Black Guy and a Montecito resident. And, um, Really excited to gather with you tonight. Uh, we have a lot to talk about. Um, I have to say that 
Tanahashi coach gave me certainly a lot to think about and uh, I'm eager to have James lead us in a conversation uh, to think about not only what was said, but the relevance that it has uh, to our community of greater Santa Barbara. Before we go much th further, tonight was made possible by really generous support from several sponsors. And I want to call your attention to those folks to be able to say a big thank you to them. Um, I'm just sharing my screen quickly to say um, at the top of the list to shout out and thank the Pacific Graduate Institute Alumni Association, to thank Hospice of Santa Barbara, the Santa Barbara Foundation, also the Center for uh, Academic Education and Development, uh, which hosts the Elite Scholars Program, and as well as the ongoing support that um, Coffee with the Black Guy has received from the Montecito Journal. Uh, so tonight is really made possible through this support and want to really tip our hats to all these organizations and the leadership of the organization. If anyone on this call at the end of the event feels so moved and really excited about the opportunity to sponsor, uh, feel free to reach out at pwabg.com, that stands for Coffee with a Black Guy, dot com, and we'd be happy to have a conversation with you about that. Um, let me just touch on a few housekeeping items and then we're going to get right into it. Um, I've seen that most people have their names listed on their Zoom screens. Thank you for that. Anybody who can have their screen on, please do. It just adds to the experience. Um, we are going to send a few surveys throughout the event and you'll just see it pop up on your screen. Um, I'm just gonna launch one right now so you can get the feel of it. And um, it's just to get a little bit of feedback from everybody on the call. And um, feel free to put in your answer and uh, most likely James will report out to us uh, what, we've, what we've heard and, and learned. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to some of our sponsors, to um, uh, Diane Travis Teague, who's the Director of Alumni Relations at Pacific Graduate Institute, and to David Selberg, who's the CEO of Hospice of Santa Barbara. Please. Shall I start, Diane? Please. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Casey. Hospice of Santa Barbara is so grateful to be a co-sponsor this evening of Coffee with a Black Guy, entitled Race to Justice, hosted by James Joyce III. One key lesson we, all of us, are learning is that being a supportive and a quiet ally is not enough. I recall during my 21 years of LGBTQ work and activism from the 1980s through the early 2000s, this early 2000s, this, this movement focused on building allies, while building allies. In these current times we are living in, simply being an ally is not enough. We must be anti-racist and not leave this work to those who are, who are oppressed themselves by us simply being allies. This is a key difference. At Hospice of Santa Barbara, we are striving to reach out to communities of color, particularly the African-American community. Inclus inclusivity in who we serve in all our programs, who we employ, who sits around the table at our board meetings is all the ongoing work before us at Hospice of Santa Barbara. I have the honor now to introduce my longtime friend and hospice board member, Diane Travis Teague, Director of Alumni Relations at Pacifica Graduate Institute. Diane, hello and thank you. Hello again, David, and thank you. Good evening, everyone. We at Pacifica certainly concur with your remarks, David, and thank you. We are proud to be sponsors of both Hospice of Santa Barbara and Coffee with a Black Man, Black Guy, pardon me. Tonight's <laughs> conversation is urgent. As our communities face the continuing challenges of COVID-19, 
civil unrest in our nation's capital, and the historical second impeachment of Donald J. Trump, we need to talk to each other. We need this time and space together. Moreover, we need the voice of a sturdy leader and a champion of justice. Thank you, Diane. Four years ago, James and his colleagues <laughs> launched Coffee with a Black Guy's social movement, primarily bringing people together to share stories, have conversations, impart perspective, or just listen and learn from fellow citizens of the world. James could not have realized then that bringing people together for their social movement would soon become such an urgent priority for our Santa Barbara community and now our country. As many of you probably know, James Joyce III is the civil rights activist and founder of Coffee with a Black Guy. Into its fourth year, CWABG, the acronym, serves as a safe space for an active community, conversations about a variety of issues from the perspective of a black man. Black man. This growing grassroots efforts is hosted by James and his team in order to help put an end to racism. Simply put, Coffee with a Black Guy is coffee, connection, and conversation. The Ventura County branch of the NAACP awarded James Joyce their 2018 Distinguished Citizen Award bestowed upon an individual whose groundbreaking work increases understanding and awareness of racial and social issues. Forbes also featured Joyce and his work with CWABG in a piece published during the COVID-19 outbreak. Joyce was recognized for his outstanding leadership in aiding anti-racist conversations, even during a worldwide pandemic. He also served as a guest speaker for the Ventura County NAACP's Solidarity Rally for George Floyd. Maryland native, James Joyce is an award-winning newspaper journalist. He has written in several diverse communities across the country, covering a variety of subjects, from education to crime, to local politics, features, and more. James is a member of the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity and currently serves with the Camarillo, California chapter. Joyce was district director for Senator, state senator, Hannah Beth Jackson, who represents nearly 1 million constituents within the 19th Senate District of California and has served on various advisory boards in the area, including Impact Hub Santa Barbara, the Ventura County Leadership Academy, and the Santa Barbara Young Black Professionals. James also serves on the boards for the Common Table Foundation, formerly the Lois and Walter Capps Project, the California Association of Marriage and Family Therapists, Education Foundation, and the National Board of the Student African American Brotherhood, where he helped found the collegiate chapter while a student athlete at Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. You can learn more about the impact James is making and upcoming events at www.cwabg.com. In other words, www.coffeewithablackguy.com. So, Diane, you and I are going to say, it, it is with is so great, so hard, hard, hard and our honor to present to you James Joyce. Joyce the third. James? <laughs> wow, I, I, I didn't know that you, <laughs> I didn't realize you all had a little uh, ebony and ivory rendition going on there. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much. I appreciate that and and uh, and so much more for your sponsorship and, and continued friendship. Thank you so much. Uh, I know that, 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 that you all didn't come here to hear a bunch of accolades and that stuff. You just want to dive in to the conversation and, and kind of want to center you on what it is that we're doing here tonight. Um, you know, uh, uh, what uh, the UCSB Arts and Lectures has done through their Race to Justice series, is they've brought top notch thinkers, writers, uh, people who are movers and shakers uh, to our community to share with us about issues of race and, and justice. 
Uh, and so far, we, you know, in this series, they've had uh, the uh, Dr. Ibram Kendi, uh, the uh, author of How to Be an Anti-Racist. Um, we've had Brittany Barnett, a lawyer combating mass incarceration. Uh, and she's the author of a book called uh, A Knock at Midnight, A Story of Hope, Justice, and Reform. Uh, there was uh, uh, Rihanna Gib Giddens uh, performed and shared her, uh, her banjo and fiddle playing as part of this series. Uh, we've had uh, the film John Lewis, Good Trouble, uh, was screened and, dis and discussed uh, a discussion with the filmmaker, uh, Don Porter. Uh, 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 Sister Helen Prejean, um, who has been a, a, an outspoken advocate uh, against the death penalty. Um, she uh, spoke in the abolition of the death penalty, and then we've also seen that issue uh, come up since she's come to our community virtually to do that. Uh, and we've had the Cohanna Jones, who spoke about her 1619 project uh, and the role uh, of investigative journalists and, and that kind of thing. Uh, and so on Tuesday night, we had the most recent leg of this Race to Justice series uh, where UCSB uh, professor, Dr. Terrence Wooten, um, uh, he uh, sat down and had a conversation with uh, uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates. Uh, Ta-Nehisi has, has been, you know, uh, dubbed the uh, modern day James Baldwin uh, of, of our time uh, um, and upon his, the way that he thinks and, and articulates his thoughts uh, and his reflections on what is happening in our world right now. Um, and so, uh, uh, um, you know, we wanna just give an opportunity to unpack some of that stuff because that early on, uh, one of the, or towards the end of the conversation on Tuesday night, one of the things, uh, one of the questions that the community had uh, for Ta-Nehisi was, um, you know, how, how, do, how do you help white people have these conversations? Um, and that is a, a question I hear time and time again. Um, and uh, what I heard uh, Tanahasi Coates uh, articulate was he doesn't know. His direct quote is, I don't know. That's never been a strong area for me. He was clear, piercingly clear about his focus being that of the plight of the black male. That's an area I've done quite a, a, quite a bit of uh, work and, and well, have lived in that space. Um, and so uh, I, I'm very appreciative for what he has contributed to the culture. Uh, and actually had an opportunity to say that to him face to face at the beginning of 2020 uh, uh, as I was celebrating New Year's Eve in New Orleans that was before COVID. Um, and so it, it was very apropos to be able to uh, uh, have him join our community uh, earlier this week and, um, you know, start to give us, I think that uh, uh, Dr. Wooten uh, said that it starts to give us some language around some of the issues that we're dealing with now, right now. And, and I, I think that that's a, a good uh, place to kick off and a good place to start to articulate some things. But first I wanna make sure that, you know, you, you're aware of some of the ground rules. It's not, I call them ground rules. I'd like to say guiding principles, um, but some basic guiding principles are, are be respectful, um, be genuine, be willing to listen, uh, be willing to feel something. Uh, and don't seek to dominate with your story. And so when you get, you will have an opportunity as you ask questions and interact, uh, but we just ask that you, you kind of respect the space uh, and, and, and the understanding of give, uh, uh, give before you get. Um, and so uh, um, without any further ado, I think we're gonna go ahead and kick it off with one of our, our survey questions. Did we, did we do the, the sample earlier or is this the first one, Casey? This is the second one. Uh, so the majority of folks weren't at the Tuesday event. So I think it's good that you gave some of that background. And um, let's see, looks like from this poll that um, almost 50% of people have come to actively engage with the community on issues impacting black people or people of color. That's at 50% and all the others around 10%. So that's the overwhelming response. Um, I will make a plug here as well. Uh, I, I believe it's dropped, the, the link has been dropped in the chat, but we're also streaming on Facebook. And so uh, as we get kicked off with the conversation on toggle on your screen, go to Facebook and share that link. Let folks know that you're having this conversation because these conversations are good to have, but they're, they're, um, they can serve as an entry point to some of these, these, these tougher issues that folks are having a tough time uh, uh, digesting. Uh, and articulating their feelings on. I mean, 
mean, it's, 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 it's not easy stuff. Um, and so uh, uh, again, without further ado, I will open it up for uh, any question uh, that folks would like to talk about. Uh, uh, and and if, if I, it, it takes a little bit to get that going, um, I will first go ahead and applaud uh, the conversation, the fact that the conversation on Tuesday night started around comics and, and Ta-Nehisi Coates' uh, uh, um, activity in the comic realm. Um, and, you know, it was very clear that uh, uh, Mr. Coates is also a big fan of Spider-Man as I am. Um, and so it's, uh, uh, as he was talking about some of the writings that he's done for Black Panther and some of the comic pro programs that he's had, uh, um, it was great to hear uh, about that. And then also for him to articulate uh, and highlight something about the connection that, that we have with Spider-Man that I was never really to Kino. I, I didn't I didn't realize it was a connection and that's why. But he was pointed out the fact that, you know, um, police don't like Spider-Man either. So there's something that's very connect like there's something that black men can connect to about that with Spider-Man. And, and and you know I I've, I've got to say Spider-Man's been a my, uh, kind of a superhero of mine since I was a child and playing you know youth soccer. Um, and so to hear that articulated in a way that kind of resonated out on a different tune. Um, it, it was it was just that was a dope way to kind of get the conversation kicked off. Um, and so again, if you're if you do have questions or would like to engage, you can either raise your hand using the, the Zoom platform or you can drop a, um, a, a, a comment in the chat. Um, also, if you are watching via Facebook and you would like to engage, you can come join the Zoom link. Uh, just go to cwabg.com. You'll get the link to be able to hop over in Zoom and still engage that way. And so that would be the best way uh, to do that uh, uh, unless uh, I'm otherwise directed. I see we have a question. Casey, if you can go ahead and un unmute uh, Mark Alvarado. Mark, great to see you here this evening. Um, a man that's been doing good work in, in this region for some time, if you can unmute yourself. Let me see, I have to unmute. Yes. All right, there we go. Hi, hi James, how are you, sir? Doing wonderful, great to see you, happy New Year's. Happy New Year. Well, this is a beautiful forum and I'm glad that you are being proactive in, in opening up this conversation in this space. You know, I, under, I understand that more African-American students in Santa Barbara Unified go through the expulsion process than, than white students. Um, and the population numbers are just, they're not the same. The demographics are totally different. We have a very small African-American population in our school district. And it really just disturbs me that to, to learn the, that a majority of our African-American students go through that process than, than white students. Can you speak a little bit about that? It, yeah, I mean, I, I can can speak about that, you know, anecdotally here. I don't have kids yeah. in the school system, I don't oh. have kids, but I can also speak from personal experience of having that in a, in a very similar uh, um, percentage uh, school district in, in Westminster, Maryland. And, um, you know, it, it's, I, I think part of what that is, is a, a lack of cultural competency within the educators and without directly diving in and, and, and you know, you know, going and, and, and meeting with and talking to and figuring out what the specific problems are. Uh, I would, you know, from this view would say that, um, you know, that, that lack of cultural competency. And so when you see, uh, there's some cultural things that I encountered when I was in school that my teachers weren't aware of, right? And so they were like, James is disrespectful. He never looks us in the eye when we're talking to him. Then after time and time again, pointing that out, uh, my mom, who was a social worker at the time, had to instruct and work with and educate, not only deal with the situation, but educate the educators in saying, yeah, well, in, in, in our culture, a lot of times we are told not to. And when I, when I was like, I heard her say that. I'm like, no, we're not. And then I realized, well, yeah, that's exactly what I was doing. And it, and it kind of goes back to the whole servant master thing. If you want to be, you know, very, you know, historical about it, about, you know, looking someone in the eye who is not of your race. It, I mean, that could be a death sentence in the way that in the era that my mom was raised in, not that long ago. 
Um, and so, you know, I think that the, the, the competency of, okay, so I'm a teacher, I'm talking to a student, that's not happening. And I'm getting, I'm feeling disrespected because the student is not looking me in my eye versus the more cultural competent way is, can we sit down and, and talk eye to eye, right? Like when you, like I've seen, uh, um, you know, for, for, you know, since it's a topic that we, we're going to get on eventually, but I, I've seen law enforcement officers actually do that is like, you know, a lot of times when, when I, I realized when I was a young child and we were having an encounters, I get amped up and they were like, just sit down, sit down and talk. And, and then, you know, that's kind of what this whole platform is, is based on. When you sit down, I mean, it allows you, your, your diaphragm is situated differently. You're allowed to think and, 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 it kind of turns the temperature down a lot of times. And so, you know, when I, I just bring that up as, as one potential example of something that, that you know, a, a tool that educators could put in their tool belt to not get to the level of expulsion, right? Because if you antagonize me, and I've seen it happen, you antagonize me at the very beginning of our encounter, it's not gonna go well at, at any point down the road. And the, the educator, the teacher, the law enforcement officer, the authority figure is the person who should be in charge with and is tasked with setting that temperature, not the person who's having the encounter or the, the crisis, right? And so it, it's, in, it, it, it's important for our teachers, our educators, and then, as I said, put this in different contexts, law enforcement, um, you know, uh, what, what have you, that to, to really have some culturally relevant tools in their toolbox to address conflict sometimes when that initially happens. Um, and, you know, that's not saying treat people differently because of the way that, you know, because of the color of their skin. It's talking about treating these people, these individuals as individuals who have experiences that are, have, that, that are a reflection of their life and you understand that enough to, culture, to meet them where they are culturally. Does, does that does that make sense? Did I, did it, I it makes a, it makes a whole lot of engagement, right? It's about engaging. You know, it's like they say Johnny's not engaged. Well, you got to engage Johnny. He's there to learn, right? right. And so, and right. the other side of it too is that white families have more capacity to negotiate a transfer out of the district, a transfer to another school, where people of color have to go through more of a traumatic experience of the whole expulsion process. And, and it's just, it's, it, there are issues of equity with that, obviously, but it's just, how do we center all of this so that, it, so that Johnny doesn't have to go through that traumatic experience and get more into the engagement piece that you spoke of? Right. And, and I think that's the role of allies right now. Everybody's like, well, what do we do? Well, allies, that's what you do. You take care of that. You make sure that that changes because the people who are being the immediate victims of that trauma should not be, have to be on the front lines. If we choose to be, that's another thing. But we should not have to be the ones making that call, that request to have things be culturally relevant, to kind of tune things that, so, you know, we talk about and, and I've seen a lot of, lot of missions and things and talking about a more inclusive environment. Well, a more inclusive environment means beyond tolerance. It means in, in inclusiveness, right? And so that also means that you're gonna have to change the way that you approach things. You're gonna have to change the way that you think about things um, in, in order to make that environment truly inclusive. Um, and, and that can be a tough thing. And that, and that requires some internal work that, and you know, like I said, that's kind of why I've started this platform. It's, it's, it's an entry point to be able to start doing that internal work. Um, you know, I, I pointed out, and, and I think there was some comments that, that Mr. Coates had said, said on Tuesday that support this as far as, um, you know, reading is a very intimate thing, right? It's a, um, you know, I, I, it's, this is what one, of, one of his books, Between the World and Me, a great, great quick read book. <laughs> and look at that. <laughs> I didn't plan this, but my bookmark, Spider-Man. Um, so it, it's a great read book, but when, when you're reading a book, it's something that is very um, intimate. You and the author, you and this story. And that's good for uh, an extent. Moving that thought process, moving that inquisitiveness, that curiosity into a community like this to have conversations, to ask questions, to engage, like that is where the real development and the ball starts rolling, right? So the book, reading the book is just the beginning, you know, 
what do they say that the whole snowball effect at the top of the mountain you, it starts off as a small thing right and so uh you know read the books read the books and then have the conversations and then spend the money appropriately like invest your money in the things that you care about now and then things will continue to change right like it's a it's it's a, 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 a metaphor that we all are familiar with on so many different levels, uh, but I think it's one that works appropriately here as well. Thank you. Th thank you for that, Mark. Yeah. Other questions. Uh, I saw um, Mike Gibbons. There's a question on uh, accountability. Um, so how can we hold... I, 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 you, we can, you can feel free to, to come in and speak up, but I'll go, go ahead and read it until we get, get there to you, Casey, if you can help with Mike Gibbons. Um, how can we hold ourselves and our leaders accountable as it relates to policing uh, differences between those of color uh, and those that are not of color? Okay, yes. Context being the stark differences between the Black Lives Matter protest during the summer of 2020 versus the riots and the insurrection at the Capitol in 2021. Um, did I did I appropriately sum that up there, uh, Brother Gibbons? Yeah, yeah. You, no, you did. And it, I mean, it's it was kind of a long, lengthy, lengthy question. That's why I just let it stand and uh, allowed you to read it. But I guess my I guess a, just a summary of my question is kind of like I mean, what can we do? Um, as a group or what can we do to help influence others to really hold like ourselves accountable so that we can really have um, marched, marched closer towards like more of the equality, right? Because um, it's, it's, I mean, a, a lot of the, a lot of the, for me, you know, a lot of the reasons why we have these great discussions is because um, there is a problem, right? And, um, and there's several problems in any direction you go. But for me, a lot of the problems really just steers back to the uh, inequities, uh, injustice. Um, then it kind of just falls back into some, a lot of times that bucket of, of, uh, of racism, which is like under the bigger umbrella of, of like, of like hatred, right? Or, or, or not a lack of love, if you, if you will, right? But I guess just kind of to unpack all that, I guess the real focus of my question is more like, you know, I'm just curious to get from you and then maybe from others, like on the call, like what, what can we do to uh, really hold ourselves accountable? Uh, because it's clear, I mean, it's, it's been clear to me on what the inequities are. And, and, and then like, that's one example that I provided, right? Um, you know, the difference between how people are treated um, for protesting um, in, in one scenario and then how people are treated in another scenario. And it's like, to me, that's, that's one of the more stark differences and obvious in your face. Um, sometimes it's easy for people to maybe to look past it or not realize it. But I guess for me, it's like, it's, oh, there it go, there it again, there it goes again. Like I see yeah. it happen again, right? Right. No, I mean, it's the whole notion of two Americas and you can't get, yeah. you know, you can't be blind to the fact that there are absolutely two Americas as far as it comes to policing. How can we get over that? There's, you know, and I think that's where you start to have the defund the police conversation. Uh, folks think that that's, you know, like throwing out flames out of your mouth. Well, no, let's talk about what defund the police really means. Um, it means like basically scrapping the whole notion and figuring out, okay, what we let's reimagine. Let's, you know, California, we are the state that invents the future, right? We're innovators. Why are we opposed to defund the police? We get an opportunity to be innovative and imagine what policing in our communities look like. And it doesn't have to be a blanket uh, uh, thing across the, the, you know, across the state, across the country, um, because it's been pointed out to me by law enforcement that there are no national standards for law enforcement. There's no national standards for use of force. There's no national standard right. for training anything of that nature. And so when you look at what happened in, at the Capitol, from a political and logical standpoint, I understand that there was a difference in territory and that Washington DC has always had a, had a little bit of a, a funky area because they've got federal property in the middle of a district of Columbia, which is essentially a city, not the same, uh, doesn't have the same uh, um, uh, powers as, as a state. So the governor doesn't, uh, the, the mayor, 
of DC can't bring in the National Guard the way the governors can of a state. Um, and so there's things like that logically and intuitively that I know, but I think what you're, you're picking at is regardless of those things, there just tends to be this uh, vitriol uh, towards communities of color, specifically black folks. And we're always the, getting the tail end of, of, the, of those uh, 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 thoughts. And, and, and what I say to that is I th say, you know, as we're defunding the police and reimagining what policing looks like, that can and should mean increased scrutiny at the front end, right? So as you're bringing in and you're hiring, really putting these, these, these candidates through the ringer um, as far as background checks, the same way that you do with uh, um, classifications in the military, right? To get different classifications of, of, of security clearance, you need to go through various background checks. And I think that there should be a level of that that is done way beyond what is currently done. Um, and knowing again that, that, is, that there's no national standard for hiring either, that that's something that could be implemented. Right. And so have it, having a, a national police review screening agency that does just that, uh, I'm sure, I mean, to get classifications in the military, they have an agency that does that. And so, you know, uh, it does go against the whole notion of smaller government. And I understand that that's a notion that's important to some people. But uh, I think that this is even more important as far as putting to in, in something that, that um, could help not help alleviate these negative stereotypes, these negative images of law enforcement, right? Um, if we weed them out at the front end, there's that. And then, you know, maybe every five years you're due for a review uh, and constant review of social media and your activity and things like that to keep these guys, guys and, and women on their toes because, um, and, I, and, and I'm thinking of these on the fly as we know how these things have come out and how, you know, you know uh, uh, in my home state of Maryland, there was an Anne Arundel County a uh, police uh, officer who was suspended uh, pending an investigation of his involvement in the insurrection against the U.S. Capitol. Like, wait, what? And that's happening in departments all across the country. And so um, instead of being reactive to that, be proactive and, and, and have some things in place that can, can do that. And that's just, you know, one idea to kind of get, get the ball going. Um, so, so thank you, thank you for that, uh, Mike, who is joining us from Oxnard. Right. Um, right. Uh, I do see another question in here, and I want to want to bring this up because it's very specific to Santa Barbara. But Sherry has uh, Sherry Higgins asked a question about, you know, what can we say to our Black and Latin teenagers who are fearful of gun violence due to the recent murders uh, murders in our community? And we have experienced, I believe, there were two incidents uh, in recent weeks uh, in the Santa Barbara community. Uh, and you know, there's and there's you know, some things there. hanging out there. And and Sherry, if you if you're able to, to put some additional context onto this, maybe you you're aware of where things are. Sure. Last I heard there was still um, I heard there was still the, the last I heard they still had not caught the the assailant in, in one of the shootings. No, they haven't, and that's why, you know, my my black teenager and, um, you know, Latin ex teenager, once, and her friends are saying if that would have been two white teenagers murdered, the police would have probably already caught the, um, the perpetrators. And so, but at the same time, they're fearful to go outside because they don't know when this is going to happen or how it might happen. And it creates a, a real fear, a, a real fear that it's hard to, to deal with, to, to make them, you know, not be fearful. And, you know, how do you explain that there is different treatments yeah. to murders of white people and people of yeah. color? So that's why I brought that because, um, you know, even in the past, when, when there were the Galita Postal shootings and all people of color were killed there, there was never really any investigation into the racist attitude of the person who killed those people. Instead, they just said that that was a mentally ill person and wrote it off like that. And so it's hard to have conversations when people don't want to really look at the racism that underlies these kind of atrocities. 
Right. Well, I, I, I'll address the initial question and then the, uh, um, as far as what some, and if you can, can mute, because I'm getting a little feedback there as I'm answering there. Um, but I, I, it's, it's a, so I, I think what's important, okay, I'll address the thing with, with, with the students, what you say to the students, uh, but I, I'll come to that here in a second. What I first want to say is that some, you know, this is why the issues of citizen review councils and that kind of stuff is important. This is why the sheriff's election is important because, you know, Galita's in the sheriff's jurisdiction. And so when you're having these conversations, they're not going to be happening in, in silos if you have people in those positions who are more open to have conversation and engagement with the community. These citizen review councils would be part of the things that would be pushing law enforcement instead of us having this conversation here. It would be a, 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 a great advocacy uh, arm to the police department to be able to say, hey, look, this, this is what we're hearing from the community. And you know, we meet with you every week so we can know how to explain it to the law enforcement so they explain, understand it in their jargon. But this is what the community is telling us. This is the perception. How can we change that? Um, and it should be this we as opposed to how can you, right? It, this is an us thing. Community, police, like we're, we're gonna need law enforcement in our communities. And so uh, this whole notion of us versus them and, and this division, I, I'm really uh, um, careful to try to lean towards more inclusive language, us, we. Um, and so I think that that's an area to go. But as far as like telling the students uh, and the young, the young folks kind of, you know, about that, you know, it's an unfortunate reality that that's, that's you know, we live in a, a violent America. Um, and, you know, this time it's hit close to home. Um, and normally it doesn't. Normally we can look and it's the other people who it's hitting to. And I think that, that um, one thing that can that the, the young folks can keep in mind is something that worked during the civil rights movement, right? I've got you know mentors of mine who who tell me about growing up in Grenada, Mississippi, um, and and having to be accountable for one another, being accountable for your brother, being accountable for your sister, be accountable for your cousin. Don't go anywhere by yourself, right? That's I mean, that's a very simple thing that can be done to to you know, help alleviate some of that angst that the youth are feeling because, it, you know, you, when you're by yourself, your mind can wonder, you're curious about what's going to happen. But when you are uh, accountable for somebody else and somebody else is accountable for you and you're checking in, does, I mean, we're, we're in COVID, so that doesn't mean that you go, you know, not social distancing. That means texting. That means, you know, uh, instant messaging. That means DMing. That means being in communication. If you're going somewhere, dropping a pin, hey, this is where my location is. Um, look out for me. Uh, just the whole notion of community. That's an, ex you know, it seems like a Pollyannish uh, recommendation, but I mean, it's just really basic community looking out for one another. And I think that that provides an, a, a greater sense of, of safety and stability. Now, let's just take that sentence and put that back in the conversation we had a second ago about uh, reimagining policing. Sounds good to me. Thank you for that question, Terry. Um, Lo Lois uh, Mitchell with uh, UCSB Arts and Lectures, thank you so much for joining us. She did point out in the chat, and I'm glad she did, uh, that the, the Coates talk from Tuesday should be available at the UCSB Arts and Lectures site uh, uh, for, um, uh, for about a week, uh, and so until about next Tuesday. And so you can go to the UCSB Arts and Lectures website and do that. I believe there is a $10 fee uh, in order to do that, but I'm telling you, it's worth it. Uh, the stuff and jewels that, that Coates had dropped on us um, it gives you some really real things to think about. And, and what these talks do is they go beyond that intimate experience of reading the book of these individuals and, and unpack some of their thought process on just um, the way things un unpack based on the questions that are facilitated. And I, I, I may, um, maybe I, I believe I saw um, Dr. Wooten hop in. Um, and if so, I, I do have, have want to want to make sure that we we highlight him because he was the one who was in communication with uh, Tanahasi on Tuesday, uh, and you know did a much better job than I would have because I would have fan got fanboyed all over it. Uh, he he did a, just a little bit, 
but you know, uh, again, Tanasi Coates is like one of the, the great thinkers on these things, and, and I highly recommend you know reading you know some of his, his writings. Um, on that note, James, there was a question from uh, Jean Kaplan, and she wrote that um, Cornell West called Coates quote unquote, neoliberal face of the black freedom struggle. And Jean's really asking you to unpack that. Yeah, uh, Cornell West, anything, you, you, you're, you're going into dangerous territory anytime you're trying to ask me to unpack uh, uh, my brother Cornell West, who, who is a fraternity brother of mine. I've actually interviewed him as a reporter and his mind is just, uh, he, he, I, every time I, I talk to him, I, I walk away with a headache. Um, so, but his, his statement of, of uh, uh, Cornell West's statement of ta Coates being the liberal, neoliberal face of the Black freedom struggle, I think is rooted back in to the ex, uh, explosion of, of ta Coates' uh, Coates' uh, popularity. Uh, it was, I believe it was in uh, 2015, he wrote an article for The Atlantic uh, uh, unpacking, you know, making the case for reparations. Um, and so, you know, when he made that case and, 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 and it was a very well articulated, um, um, you know, essay, uh, and I would encourage anyone who hasn't to go check that out. But um, I mean, I, I think that could be like that he emerged on the scene in pop culture because of him making a, a, a salient argument for a case for reparations in America for the descendants of, of slaves. And um, that got the conversation started again. Um, the conversation had kind of gone gone along and got quiet right before the primary election for this past election. So uh, the, 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 the 2020 election primaries, um, uh, when Marianne Williamson, I believe that was the beginning of 2019, when she brought up the, the case of reparations and brought that back into uh, popular conversation. And so I think, Gene, that might be part of the reason uh, of why uh, 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 Cornell uh, West is, is, is saying that. Um, but it's also, uh, you know, he's been the voice that we collectively have looked to uh, time and time again on these issues. And, and, and whenever something happens or, you know, based on the fact of his book and, and un, like what that those on the, either the beautiful, uh, beautiful struggle, whether it's uh, uh, between the world and me, um, you know, these things are uh, um, kind of, I mean, he, I hate the term thought leader, but he's a thought leader on what uh, uh, it means to be free and Black in America. Um, yeah. Hope, hopefully that, that addressed uh, that question, Gene. Uh, Bunker Frank from Yakima, joining us from Yakima. Appreciate you. Doesn't oh, say it there, but I know. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you for remembering the bunker. I, I really appreciate it, James. And of course, you know, you're going to be speaking to the Yakima Rotary in a couple of weeks. And we were fortunate in our Rotary Racial Justice Committee under the leadership of Eric Silvers to have had a, a committee discussion. Um, I'm probably, when I look around the, the Zoom folks, I'm probably one of the oldest and maybe one of the few who grew up in a state, West Virginia, uh, during uh, segregation and experienced integration. And um, as an adult have always had um, um, fairness and uh, just authentic communication as a part of my background, uh, as well as taught at Jackson State University in Jackson, Mississippi for a few years. Um, my question is this, knowing the work that has gone on and now having spent about a year in the most segregated situation with shelter in, in place that people have had, uh, having probably worked through a lot of their, their thinking, their comfort zones, their interaction, I'm wondering, uh, it, that, that you and your organization and the other professionals on the Zoom have um, started to have any advanced placement thought of how uh, to bring people out of the segregation that we've been in and isolation, not only uh, culturally, but in terms of uh, uh, 
remunerating, you know, um, poverty, all the social conditions that we care about, uh, but maybe have not participated in. Sure, sure, sure. Well, I, in the introduction you heard, I'm on the board of an organization called the Common Table Foundation. And uh, the name of the organization, it used to be the Lois and Walter Capps uh, Project. Uh, we changed the name to the Common Table Foundation because as this Santa Barbara community had gone through uh, several disasters and it had been you know, three years ago that we went through the Montecito mudslide, uh, it was directly as we were emerging out of that, that that same question came, how do we how do we come together as a community after a traumatic event? And so essentially it's the same answer, I think. Um, and the Common Table Foundation, uh, the, name, the name change came from an event that was we were, had where we just had a field and set tables out in the middle of the field and invited folks to come from the community and bring food and, to, and bring enough to share with your neighbor. Uh, and, and, it, it's, and it's a situation where you're in a community and you're sitting side by side with people who you wouldn't normally uh, uh, sit next to. And, and these events were held around the community on different sections of our community and brought together folks within those, you know, the, in journalism, we used to call it hyper-localization. It's like, you know, the east side or the west side or, the, you know, those kind of communities, uh, that, that size of regionalism for communities and really brought out folks to engage on a level and, and it's just simple as, I mean, the whole notion of coffee with the black guys, just, it's not nothing nothing too intimidating. It's just coffee. We're sitting down to have coffee in a conversation, right? Um, and so it's very similar to that is, is you really get to know a person when you break bread. Uh, and, and I think that that could be, um, and, and it's, it's a way that in our organization, we've talked about, okay, how do we prepare ourselves to be ready for this reemergence out of COVID? Exactly for that reason is what you're saying is the fact that um, you know, people are going to need that connection. Um, and, and how are we going to get that? And we're, I think, going to have to be very intentional about that. Um, and it also is going to very largely depend on what we're allowed to do based on the eff efficacy of vaccines and, 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 and all of that. Like, so like allow, of course, the public health decisions to make the, you know, to or help public health issues to make those decisions uh, for us, to inform those decisions. But, um, you know, it, it, I think it would be just as simple as breaking bread and, and really getting to, you know, taking all that like fanciness off. Like we, we've been isolated. We need to just go back to basics and have interpersonal communication skills and communicate with one another. That communication doesn't always mean agree. Um, and so really learning to, to get through, through that stuff. Uh, so thank you for that question. I'm going to continue to scroll down here. I'm not really having a lot of success uh, utilizing our Google Doc there, uh, Jared or Casey. But uh, I do see that it was noted that in addition to this book, there's also an HBO film by the same name. Um, I haven't watched it yet, uh, but Catherine and her husband have, and uh, they had already read the book and they were blown away by the film. And so um, uh, recommend checking that out. And I, 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 it, it's on my to view list already. So thank you for that nudge. Um, so James, Catherine Dean writes that um, Coates used the phrase toxically free to describe the insurrection of the Capitol. And would yeah. you elaborate how it relates to Black freedom in the United States? Right, and I, I, I'm glad you brought that up because I think, uh, Catherine, I think that that goes back to um, also, and he, I don't know if he made the connection, but for me, in my mind, it made the connection with that whole how black folks are looking for a place of home, right? And there's always this, this in search uh, of home and find to create, create a sense of place. Uh, and how, what does that look like in the scope of, of white supremacy? And so I, I really think that that's, you know, that that's what we um, were looking at last week, right? Is is Black folks have known that that's not been our home, um, but it was just a reminder of that. Um, and you know, the stories that came out of the the, the black uh, Capitol police officers who encountered these these crowds, um, and the, you know, the vitriol that was spewed at them racially and for the fact that they're law enforcement is the, you know, like that. There was a hip hop song made years ago. Uh, uh, was that KRS One? Uh, black cop 
it, it talked about specifically black, like the song is called Black Cop. And it talks about how this duality for a black cop is. And I mean, you know, that's a whole nother topic for a whole nother, you know, specific session uh, that we could e easily uh, make happen. But that is, is, is kind of what um, this whole toxic freedom is, right? Like that toxic freedom, like the toxicity of their freedom and the audacity of their whiteness to be able to go and make demands of their government by rushing the building, you know, laws be damned. Like, like that, there's something very dangerous about that. And, 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 you know, those law enforcement officers, the black law enforcement officers, the Capitol police, like they had a traumatic experience, right? I, I wonder if they go to their superiors and say, you know, um, are, are, is that being treated, that experience for them, is that being treated the same as a use of force? If they had to pull their trigger and shoot somebody, they're put on administrative leave pending an investigation and or reduced in whatever their, their, their uh, uh, workload is. I wonder if those black officers who had to deal with that traumatic event on last Wednesday have been afforded any mental health treatment for that? I don't know. These are questions to ask. I'm throwing this out there. Somebody who has access to that, feel free to ask those questions. I can't do it all. But you know, those are the kinds of things, and that's the kind of thought process. Uh, and again, that just kind of came up to my mind as this question was like unpacking. But you know, like <clears throat> that's the danger of things, right? And we look at, you know, oh, you know. Look at the, the impact of war on veterans, and look at PTSD, and the fact that there's, you know, that is an area where it's recognized the impact of trauma, and there are things to unpack that and to un, 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 unravel that trauma that is happening. When are we going to get that recognition? Because that kind of trauma is much, as much, it's as common in the Black experience as I would say it is in the, the veteran experience. If I recall, and somebody feel free to correct me on this, but if I recall, I believe about 30 to 40% of former veterans are diagnosed with PTSD. Um, and I, I would argue that a much higher uh, a percentage of black folks in America probably have a level of, of, of post-traumatic experience uh, uh, impact. I don't know if you want to call it a disease, a, a trauma, or what, but it, there's an impact uh, to that, and I think that 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 is also part of that that toxic freedom uh, to address that question. Uh, so thank thank you for that, Catherine and Casey. Other questions. There's some good Daryl McNeil. Okay. Daryl, you might want to unmute yourself and just give voice to the question yourself if you'd like. Sure. Um, and my apologies for writing so long in the chat. Um, first of all, what's up, my brother? How you doing? Doing great. Great to see you, Daryl. Um, my question is. Are you concerned that the narrative of the white supremacists who stormed the Capitol and in addition to the enablers within the ranks of law enforcement and federal government will somehow dilute the messaging of all the work that black folks did to remove Trump from office in swing states and um, motivate the shift in the Senate with the races in Georgia? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. And you already know the answer to that. Absolutely. It's been overshadowed. I mean, that happened on the morning of the insurrection. And that's all we talk about from, you know, January 5th is the insurrection. We don't talk about the fact that Georgia flipped blue, Georgia, Georgia flipped blue. And that took the, you know, took the Senate from uh, Republican rule to Democratic rule. And that means that there's conversations that can happen now, because there were folks in the GOP party who were opposed to even having the conversation, right? And so, you know, that that's what this is all about is, is um, and I think it's important for folks like us there. I know that, you, you know, we've been working on some things for Black History Month. It's gonna be important for us to remind folks, 
allies, it's going to be important for you all to remember to remind folks as well. Like we need to applaud the work that was done in Georgia. We haven't had a chance to do that yet. We should. Um, and again, that's just one example of, 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 and the most one of the most recent examples of Black folks saving America. Uh, and and Coates did did highlight some of that thought, the whole the whole uh, idea or notion of, of of blackness being a superpower. Um, uh, he did he he did touch on, on that, and I think that that's very um, very interesting. Um, and, I, and, and you know, and there's a strong case to be made for that based on, you know, the past year, year and a half alone. Um, so, yeah, thank you for bringing that up, Daryl. But I, I think, you know, we're going to have to keep beating that drum and reminding folks um, and, and, you know, uh, allowing, you know, really encouraging our leadership to remind folks too, our new president, our new vice president, um, you know, they've acknowledged that that's the reality. They, they know what's up. Uh, we just need to remind them what's up. Thank you. And a quick plug for, for Daryl. Daryl and Sally, so last year here in Santa Barbara, we did a Black History Month Culture House. For the first time, we actually had a space on State Street during the month of February to hold programming on the, on the weekends. We had five weekends last uh, of uh, February. Um, and as soon as we got done doing all that great programming, uh, we had to go into COVID. Uh, and so uh, we're looking to, to replicate some of that stuff this year. So stay tuned uh, to that. How are we at 8 o'clock oh, already? Um, James, if I may interject, yes, we are like doing um, the Santa Barbara Black History Culture House, and you know, thanks for shouting us up. Um, we're going to be doing it virtually, obviously, given the situation that's happening as far as the pandemic. But we're also partnering with a number of organizations, as you are aware, um, who are doing similar programming for Black History Month. Um, I don't know how to communicate that to all the folks in the room, but um, we'll certainly get the information to you and somehow or another, we'll figure out a way to disseminate that information to everybody else. Yeah, no, I, I, we've been able to, to amass a, a great list, uh, an email list that I don't utilize enough. I'm told uh, you don't get enough emails from me. So um, Maybe we can utilize the email list to send out the the kind the information for what we're doing locally for Black History Month when we get have that all cooked up. Uh, I believe our email list is close to uh, 700 people at this point um, um, from across the the country, but mostly in the Santa Barbara region. Um, um, and so we'd like to you know continue to see this grow um, both locally and across the country. Other questions? Other questions here. Um, and and as, as uh, Casey, as you kind of help get, you know, kind of queue up that next question, I think what uh, it's, it's important to point out, okay, we'll, you know, we'll stay here for at least an hour, uh, but we're having a good conversation. So I'm going to be here continuing for at least another, uh, another half hour or so to continue to have this conversation. I understand that that can be a lot uh, for some folks, uh, um, can be a lot to, to unpack, but there's a lot of good questions and stuff that I have not yet to get to in this chat. So I want to keep that stuff going um as much as possible uh, uh casey so james mary becker asked to talk more about reparations and mary yeah. i'm not sure if you want to elaborate on that uh or just let uh james take it from there yeah i'll say a little bit more um <clears throat> i notice the idea of reparations coming up you know, and then it dies and nothing's said and nothing's followed up on it. And so I think it's interesting, um, even uh, Tenehasi Coates brought it up, but didn't really delve into it on, uh, on Tuesday. But, but, you know, we're directing a lot of attention at the Capitol <clears throat> last Wednesday on the white supremacists who came in, but, you know, they wouldn't have been there if there hadn't been a lot of well-off white people, you know, behind Trump all along. And, and then, uh, you know, kind of what's going to alter the, some perceptions here. And what I, what seems to me really apparent is from, from the very beginning of slavery, it was about this economic thread running through, running through, running through. And here we are you know, today with what, um, 
African American households having, you know, how much, you know, so much less ownership in homes, so much less economic power, all that. So this whole economic thread seems to be running through. And it just seems to me as though reparations, I'm just reflecting on my own, you know, thinking about it. And um, that could be a, that could be at least a tangible way of saying, yeah, you know, real injustice has been done over centuries. Yeah. And yeah. how well, I, and to do, you know, to somehow to get into that. Yeah, so the state of California has, uh, and the state of California is gonna have, a, I believe, a nine person task force that's gonna be convened to start talking about and studying reparations. Uh, and so that'll be happening here in the state of California. They've also uh, put forth a resolution to support HR 40, which was has been introduced uh, time and time again. Initially, it was introduced by Representative John Conyers. Uh, and most recently, I believe we talked earlier, it's Sheila, Sheila Lee, uh, Representative Sheila Lee from Texas. Uh, um, and so, you know, those are things to keep our eyes on. And I absolutely agree. Uh, if you follow me on Twitter, I've said, uh, and I've tweeted a couple times recently, is that eventually we're going to have to get the conversation back to reparations. We can talk about all this feel good stuff and diversity and inclusiveness and all that kind of stuff and have these conversations in our workplace. Yeah, that's just a step on the way, getting us ready to really have a real serious conversation about what a reparations look like. And I think HR 40 allows that study, the study, it's a commission to be able to study what that looks like. That allows the conversation to be able to, to, to start happening. Um, and, I, and I think anything that there, there's a, um, um, a social media following on, I believe it's called the Reparation Fund. And it's, it's essentially allies, white and brown people who uh, align with this idea of reparations and allow that to be part of their identity and they they consider themselves reparationists um, and you know maybe we need a more of a movement for rep of reparationists um, but what do reparations look like I believe that um, personally I think that that you know that we need to have the study we need to figure out okay what's the economic impact we were promised 40 acres and a mule descendants of slaves were promised 40 acres and a mule upon emancipation, the Emancipation Proclamation. And what ended up happening is Abraham Lincoln provided reparations payments from the government to the slave owners for their loss of labor. Uh, and so like that's, uh, that's where we get that connection to the UD USDA that some folks shy away from. Um, the fact that that was part of that, um, you know, so, so when you're looking at a promise of 40 acres and a mule, uh, that being the equivalent of ownership and wealth. Um, if you look at the generational wealth of the typical black family in America and the typical white family in America, there's a disparity, uh, inequity. Um, and so like, that's what we ultimately did, ultimately need to come over, uh, overcome. But in parallel to that, in the parallel to the financial aspect of reparations, it is adamant that we have some sort of truth and reconciliation. And so conversations like this is a start to that one parallel track to reparations, but the other part of that leg is the financial inclusiveness. Like this, this whole notion of what, do, what does reparations mean? It's an opportunity for America as a nation to atone from its original, for atone for its original sin, right? And say like, okay, this original sin of enslaving other humans and treating them as property and making them work and building our whole wealth as a nation on that labor, the fact that America is what it is is because cotton was what it was in the in economic markets back in you know the 1700s, 1800s, and so cotton was created to be what it is as a commodity because of the free labor. It didn't cost that much to produce cotton when you had free labor. Right. And so, yeah, all right. So it costs the, the, the slave owner money to keep all the slaves like, you know, there's there's food costs feeding them and all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, medical and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Whatever. So um, but like, let's really have that conversation in an intelligent way and talk and put dollar figures on that. So uh, this family who is now um, in this position, let's trace their lineage back to their slave owning family members, they had X number of slaves. When they sold those slaves, how much money did they get? 
they got yeah, that well, there are, yeah there are all kinds of uh, complicated complicated things but having the conversation is absolutely a starting place so is this if i google reparationists will i find this group that's putting energy and money into it I, I believe it's the reparation fund. Let me double check here real quickly on okay. the slide. But I'll look I, for I, it. If I, that's what I, I, I think I, I think that that that's what it is. And and so you know, I mean, it's really um, you know, it, it 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 it's a conversation that folks shouldn't shy away from. As far as like, okay, I don't want to have it. I think reparations are bad. I, they're not going to take my money. No, it's not. It's not necessarily about that. Um, I've also uh, thrown out the idea of. Um, creating a government entity. And again, going back to that whole small government, big government argument. Um, yeah, reparations fund. Uh, fund for reparations now is what it is. Um, but so go, go, go back to, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, where did I got, got sidetracked there? Uh, reparations, oh, and having the conversation about, about reparations and we're gonna go and really start to document, okay, what's that, the, the dollar figure uh, look like and how do we start to recoup that? Does it look like does it look like um, a, a free college? Does it look like you know universal health care? What does it look like? Does it look like a, a check, a payment? Um, I think a way logically that it could work, and like I said, I had, had thrown this idea out there, is you know create a government entity that is a is a, 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 a office of Black American research. The Office of Black American Research, anybody who claims or feels as if they're a descendant of a slave, they have, they can go, I could go to this Office of Black American Research, and this agency is funded by the government to help Black Americans do their lineage research, right? And the reason you do that would do that research is this office would exist. I would go to this office and say, all right, I'm you know, James Joyce. This is my parents, my grandparents. This is what I know about my family thus far. Can you help us do this? And then they start to unpack and do all the tracing. They realize, oh crap, well, your family were, your, this, on your dad's side, you were owned by this family, but on your, your mom's side, you all were freedmen. Okay, so then the one drop rule would go the same as it has in America all of this time. And so then therefore, then I would be entitled to reparations because of uh, the fact that uh, my family had done that. Now, because I'm the black person in my family who did that research and I go to there and unlock that, then that unlocks all of my family members, right? And so then all of my family members get a letter in the mail that say, hey, you, this family member has come to the Office of Black American Research. And I'm making this up on the fly and the details of this, but somebody should be writing this down because I think that this is an office that could really exist. But you know, you go there, you start to ask those questions, they do the research, they send a letter to all the family members that they unlock access to be able to apply for reparations. And then once you've done the research, you've been verified by this agency, then you go on to the next step and then you're allowed to get whatever that is, whether it's your check, whether it's your free education, whether it's a, an 825 credit score, uh, however they wanna work this out. I think that there, there may even be an option to have a, a, a choice. I, if, I, if, if it's been proven and I, I'm in my family and this person in my family, we, have, we can choose our reparations to be different. I choose, to go with the 825 credit score, they choose to go with universal health care. All right. So then they and their family have universal health care and I just have the credit score. But that is allowing me to be able to go build equity, generational wealth, uh, because of the, the rules and laws. I think uh, in addition to that is also the education. Uh, what is, you know, the, the financial education. Uh, don't just give me a check, give me an education on what to do with that check and how to create generational wealth. And I know that they're you know, wealth management strategies, who's been a big supporter of these conversations, like that's a big part of what uh, 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 Guy Walker and Warren Ritter, that's like what they talk about is this whole idea of creating generational wealth and, and have those conversations with your family and putting things in place in order to secure those things. And I think that that, that is parallel to the actual check uh, that happens. Um, but again, that's just me spewing off a couple of ideas off the top of my head. Well, James, based on the poll uh, feedback that we just got about potential future events, I think you will be continuing to talk about reparations because that's the top vote getter. 60% of the folks on the call are interested in continuing that conversation, followed by what does success in America look like? 
So. Um, okay. Oh, that question about what does success in America look like? I'm going to get to that here before we wrap up. But on the thing of reparations, how awesome would it be for the Santa Barbara region to be a voice in that conversation, right? The governor is, or and, and I, I, I haven't looked at it, but I, but I know the governor has some appointments on this commission, but who who's on that commission? Who's gonna be appointed to that commission about reparations? I think that's something that the Santa Barbara community can be involved in. Who is gonna be on that? Should we advocate for folks to be on there or, or should we make sure that folks aren't on there? Um, and and I, I know when they put that together, there's gonna be maybe like a representative appointed from the legislature or some other thing. Like there's a, a conglomerate that, that appoint people to this commission. But you know, once that commission is established, the job's not over, who's gonna lobby that commission and, 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 and advocate for what we think we want it to look like, right? You think what I just said is a good idea, great. Let's, let's as a Santa Barbara community, put that in a policy paper and make sure that that commission has that. Um, like those are the things that we can be doing uh, as allies to these missions is, is, is working, working that, those systems and, and changing those systems and changing those policies and procedures from the, from the inside out. And, you know, it, it, it can sometimes and quite frequently is very arduous and not instant, you know, you don't instantly feel successes, but um, those are the things that, 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 that should be addressed, I think. Oh boy, I see my long-winded sisters in the chat again. <laughs> of course, I'm going to give her a hard time. Um, Coates talked about regarding, to my understanding, two options that Black folks essentially are given to either forget or forgive and, and uh, how this juxtaposes uh, with other critical issues he brought up uh, that we never get to address, such as having healing spaces of our own, liberation and naming ourselves, the absence of home home places, um, thoughts on if we might ever, yeah. So I, I, again, so I think what, what Coates pointed out and I'm glad he did is that everybody's kind of got their lane in this movement and his lane is focusing, has been, and it has been focusing on, you know, highlighting the plight of dealing that with that pain as a black male and the cool pose and the fact that as a black male in America, we're set to have this tough exterior, but we're so wounded inside and the way that plays out in society through whether that's black on black crime, whether that's, you know, interracial dating, however you want to see that throughout the community, um, like that is a reality of it. And I think that we in our community are blessed to have uh, a, a great example of this right here in Santa Barbara, we don't have an organization called Black Lives Matter. The organization took it upon themselves to name themselves Healing Justice. And their focus is primary and specifically on they're doing what they do for the love of Black people. Uh, they're not here to placate the, 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 the needs or the demands of white Santa Barbara. They are here to focus on the needs of Black Santa Barbara. And what that means is that we and I very rarely uh, uh, get a chance to, to, to join the, the, the Zoom calls, but that means, uh, you know, one Friday a month, maybe a fr every other Friday it may be, there's a Zoom call for, for the Black community to come together and talk about these healing things. And, and there have been things that have done, been done specifically for the Black community in Santa Barbara, where we had exclusive access to Lotus Land. Uh, and, and, and that was a part of the healing process. Uh, you've got the community yoga project, commune unity yoga project uh, that uh, uh, the Vinatry Yoga has been doing, right? And really incorporating a uh, uh, black specific focus on their yoga practices. Um, and so there is a lot of these things that are happening in our community. I think we need to do a, a better job of elevating those things that are happening, highlighting those things, participating in those things. But these are just some things that I'm aware of that are ha that, that have, have happened um, uh, just off the top of my head. I'm sure there's many, many more. Um, but uh, I think that those are, are some of the things um, that are being done. Oh, a big one. Oh my gosh, the biggest one yet. Um, the, at UCSB, we had to specifically advocate for a, 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 a office, a office of Black Student Development. And, and they just have that. They're hiring people, the director, they have that. Um, they're hiring, they've hired counselors in the UCSB Office of Black Student Development. Um, there's program, the, the Umoja program at SBCC, 
Um, that's another thing like that has a black focus space, right? And I, and I think like that's a great question, but as we have these various things around our community, I think it's important for all of our community to understand what these spaces are, what they mean, the importance of them, and the importance of respecting them as a space, as a black centered space. Um, and the important, like, and what is the importance of that? It's about finding that place of home. Uh, it's about the fact that when Warren and I are, are out on the town and having a good time, uh, uh, you know, somebody who we know can say, I don't understand a word you all are saying because we're having our own space, we're having our own conversation, and we're connecting in a way that's very cultural uh, that other folks may or may not be able to tap into. And so being able to have those spaces where you can be authentically yourself, uh, when, when you can show up as your best self in a community, like that's why those things are important. Um, and, and anything that our allies can do to help support those places, help support healing justice, uh, help support the focus on, on, on elevating Blackness in our area, the more you're fertilizing the ground for that community to grow. Um, and, and so, you know, don't ignore those various opportunities as they come up. Uh, and don't ignore those various opportunities as they present themselves in, the, in, in your lives as you're going through the community. Uh, be the voice to speak up and come up with an idea that's going to help uh, support and advocate for those things. Um, you know, I'm not telling you anything that's new or, or earth shattering. Um, it's just what we should be doing to build community. Thank you. Indeed. Uh, and I'm going to give a shout out to my nephew Langston, who I understand was in the background yelling my name earlier, uh, but he should be in bed by now. Um, oh, okay. Uh, uh, Bunker, if you can please get with Eric and shoot me an email to remind me about that. I'm not going to remember that, but yes, to include that in my, my speech at the Yakima Rotary. Um, yes, El Centro, thank you for pointing out the new healing center. And I don't know a whole lot about that. So if there's somebody on the line uh, who can, can chime in, because I know that that's very important. And I saw some social media posts about that. Um, uh, but Casey, maybe if you can help unmute El Centro um, and see hey, James, uh, if somebody. Hello, sorry, Chelsea. I forgot to uh, change my name on here. But I'll, I'll hey, Chelsea. Her. Critical, beautiful work. Can Can you tell us a little bit about the the, the new healing center? I, I know that uh, Jordan and, and crew were very excited about it, but I don't want to mess up any of the the details. And, and so, and any of you all who don't know Chelsea Lancaster. She's a, a, an amazing organizer in our Santa Barbara community, uh, has been you know, at, at the backbone of a lot of our movements throughout uh, the past year uh, and beyond, and has been doing the work in the trenches for years, most recently up at SBCC uh, in supporting the students that go through the community college. Um, hi, Langston. Um, and so, uh, Chelsea, if you can tell us a little bit about the Healing Center, that'd be great. So oh, this was a really, a really beautiful collaborative effort between um, specifically Jordan Killebrew of Healing Justice and the Fund for, I'm sorry, the Santa Barbara Foundation, Carrie Tobes and some other folks creating a space at UCSB um, specifically dedicated to black students, to black youth, to black community members um, that brings in black therapists and other healers that are really um, bring in that, that loving experiential wisdom, that, that culture of care, um, again, for and by Black people. So just another really beautiful effort that has come together when you talk about that deep racial trauma, um, racial battlefield fatigue syndrome, all those things, right? Um, so yeah, I, I can send you the article too, because I think it'd be beautiful for you, to, for you to elevate that for the folks that are following you. Indeed, indeed, please, please do. And, and I'm going to go ahead and volunteer my sister, as some of you all may know, she recently moved from Baltimore to, to Oakland, and she's in Oakland now, uh, back, since back in October. Uh, she has uh, been trained and has worked as a acupuncture therapist, but really in the space, uh, you know, I'm not going to let her uh, unmute her because she, she, she's my sister. Uh, but uh, she prior to Freddie Gray stuff, uh, she was working in Baltimore, volunteering, doing some community acupuncture uh, in the North Avenue area. Um, and uh, after Freddie Gray uh, uh, incident and the rioting that had happened in Baltimore, 
um, there were some limits on the work that they were able to do for security reasons in that area, but was very eager to be able to get back in that space. And so I bring that stuff up to say that she's nothing but a short drive away. Chelsea, we will go ahead and employ her uh, as we need to. Yes. Um, yes, so, oh, I'm glad. Somebody in the chat brought up, uh, Patricia, you brought up an issue of personal contact. You're eager for in-person events. You and me both, sister. Um, yeah, what, what are they, I heard the phrase, we are touch deprived uh, through, uh, through COVID. We've been deprived of, of human contact. And so as we're talking about in-person events, I do, I'm working on something with the Community Yoga Project. I don't have all the details yet. I, the, the date, February 27th is sticking in the back of my head for some reason, that's a Saturday. Um, but we're looking to do a socially distant outdoor event coupled with yoga. So there'll be a yoga uh, class per, taught by a black teacher uh, to proceed the Coffee with the Black Guy session. Then we're gonna move into a Coffee with the Black Guy session outside uh, uh, and, and have that live streamed as well. Uh, and so anyone who feels uh, interested in that, I would encourage you to reach out to Divinity Yoga and encourage them to continue to do what they're doing and putting this together, um, as well as uh, supporting their efforts, uh, uh, because this will be one of, the, I think this will be the second time that they've done something along these lines to benefit Black lives. And so um, uh, 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 making sure that we're tapped into what's going on in our own community is the, the very best start that you can have. Um, And then James, you'll see there's a question about the handsome shirt you're wearing. Oh, I'm getting down to that. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, Miss Connie, uh, truth without justice. Yes. I, so Connie's bringing up an issue about the local media not telling the truth. We need to do a better job on with the local media on several fronts. But the fact that we don't have a daily presence is part of a challenge. Um, and for some reason, I'm coming buggy. Um, but yes, the shirt. Coffee with a black guy. I, I these shirts, I've got the mugs. Oh, and even my little notepad here that I'm taking notes in. Um, Coffee with the black guy. So you know the merchandise. It's not to make money. It's not to make me rich. What it is to do is help further and uh, it helps support the conversation, but it also helps further the conversation, right? And so if you are bold enough to wear a Coffee with the black guy shirt and you walk into uh, your local coffee shop, and we're allowed to do that again, someone's going to ask you about what that is. And so that can start conversations that need to happen. Um, you can help be a facilitator of those conversations and saying, well, what Coffee with the Black Guy is, it's a social impact movement that really allows and elevates the Black voices. And it's an opportunity to listen to and learn from these experiences. Because something that Coach pointed out, it, and I wholeheartedly agree with it, because it is at the uh, uh, root of Coffee with the Black Eye and the idea of Coffee with the Black Eye, but the whole notion of there being power in our story, um, the fact that there, you know, the black, uh, the, the black experience, and that's kind of what his first book, Beautiful Struggle, was about, is looking at what the beauty of the black experience. And I think the most re recent way that I've heard that summarized in a meme is, um, you want our rhythm, but not our, our but not our blues. Uh, and so, you know, there is a, a beautiful double-edged sword that comes with being Black in America. I love it and wouldn't trade it for anything in the world, but damn, it is tiring and damn, it is exhausting, right? But, um, you know, it beats the alternative. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, yes, Wendy. I did see uh, Wendy Sims Moten. Uh, appreciate you, Wendy, if you're still here, uh, if you'd like to say hello to the folks. Wendy is on our school board, was just recently reelected. Uh, whenever Wendy's in the house, I'd like to go ahead and highlight her because it's it, it just it's the importance of amplifying Black voices in real time, right? She's been elected to this position by members of her community. We want to help shape the way that our kids' education is, so why don't we continue to engage with Wendy sims Moton? So Wendy, if you're on still and would like to say hello, please do. I believe she may have stepped off. Um, 
No, she's with us, James. Maybe the is audio. She, oh, there she is. I, I hear her. She's unmuted now. Uh, I don't hear her, but she is unmuted. Yeah, you're unmuted, but I guess we don't we don't hear you. I, I think what happened is 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 Wendy be on Zoom so much she didn't wore out the system. It don't it don't let her talk no more. <laughs> okay, got confirmation on the, the February twenty seventh. We'll we'll keep working to get get Wendy's uh, uh, mic un, unmuted. Um, and see if we, we might be able to, to do that. Wendy, can you talk? Can we hear you? No, not still don't. Um, okay, uh, so I did get confirmation on the 27th of February for the Community Yoga Project. Uh, you're welcome, this is what we do, we appreciate it. Uh, yes, Casey, merchandise can be purchased at cwabg.com. Um, uh, Gateway Educational Service is also doing, yes, they are doing great work um, with Black youth and families both in Santa, in North and South Santa Barbara County. Um, yeah, and, and been, been engaged with, with, with Connie and Aubrey. And, you know, I, I know Miss Connie knows, you just hit me up if you need anything, because we're here. Uh, we, we've been supporting one another. Uh, as I've joked, Wendy, Connie, Jordan, Kilbrew, myself, we've been running the same circuit here since uh, George Floyd. Um, so we're often on panels together. Uh, thank you, Jackie, uh, for your support, Santa Barbara Foundation, uh, all the way moved to our community recently from Baltimore. So, you know, I always like to highlight the Maryland connections uh, of my home state. Um, okay, we've been Wendy, maybe joining with some microphone now. Um, give her a second again. Good, good stuff in the chat. I can't keep up with it all because it's coming fast and furious, but uh, very good stuff in the chat. Um, and, and make sure that you're connecting with one another. This is, again, really about building and, and encouraging community. Wendy, can, Hi, we give, can you hear me now? We got you, sister. We got you. Hey, thank you. I heard that comment about me breaking the Zoom microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. This has been awesome. I'm so glad I was able to um, join the conversation tonight. Um, I can't say enough about how important um, to make sure that our youth are involved uh, in decisions in this country, things, and be able to have conversations with them that are happening on the news to really get at the heart of their conversation. Because oftentimes we are making decisions that impact them directly, but not really have their voices at their table, their concerns being you know, um, expressed from their point of view. And so I feel such a privilege and a responsibility to be on the Santa Barbara Unified School District and to bring that voice of sometimes invisibility of our African-American students and certainly students of color. And so it's really important that 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 the community gets gets involved with our education and of our children and let them know that all of them are important with regards to that. I've just been so disheartened about the recent violence in involving our young folks, um, you know, in our community and just you know being in the situation of the pandemic does not um, help that at all. And I just we just have to continue to work with our youth, continue to elevate our youth in our community and let them know how important they are. Uh, I, I'm gonna mess up this quote, but I believe it was Nelson Mandela that said that a nation with regards to how they treat their children, um, you know, how we, in America, how do we treat our children? And I would say it, it does get weary sometimes with regards to this. And I was talking to someone else about continuing to work through the hard times to ensure that our kids have exactly what they need and, and that we continue to support them. Because we know long past these days, they are going to be impacted by what has happened during this pandemic. Because we didn't, these things got elevated during um, the pandemic, but they were there pre-pandemic. And so we need to continue to, to work on that because our children are, are crying out uh, for help and how do we do that? And so just, just last night on the board uh, board meeting, um, 
or actually Tuesday night on the board meeting, as we are beginning to really look at equity uh, in the school board. And I've never seen such engagement around equity and making things, you know, a, a level playing field for all students, how engaged, how much more engaged the community gets around that, uh, you know, one way or the other, like, do we really need this? What do you mean they have this and they have that, you know, or other this and other that, you know, in terms of peace, but it's really important. It's, it's, it's a piece that the board is working on, the direction we've given the superintendent to work on about equity, starting to look at that. Uh, in fact, we're bringing a resolution, you know, on next Tuesday to talk about equity, that it will be our guidepost to how we look at our policies, processes, hiring, all of those things, because we must do this. We must name it. We must call it so that our students know and so that the community knows what we need to do to make sure that our students have the best educational uh, you know, um, environment that they can so they can be productive citizens. And, and everyone coming through that school district can know who they are. They need to know who they are and not just, hey, you're just in here going to school, but know who you are because the curriculum is going to represent you as well. And so we're making some bold statements that also that has really increased some conversation I don't think this community has really ever had honestly. And I think we honestly have to have those honest, honest conversations. We have to name it and claim it and call it. Uh, and we have to continue to do that and be, and be not afraid um, to, to do that and be unapo unapologetic about what we need to do. And it's not just the African-American folks uh, that's in this community, but everyone in this community, has, we have to start with our students that's our future. So we have to get behind our students and support them and make sure that we're giving them the best opportunity to grow and, and, and be in conversations like this to make a difference uh, in this world. And lastly, I would just say, you know, I was talking to a friend again about, I was asking her how she was doing, right? And um, she said, I'm doing good. And she says, you know, sometimes I get weary in the work, but I never get tired of the work. I get tired in the work, but never get tired of the work. And we can never get tired of the work of making this a better world for our students, a better world for our community, a better for our students and for our community in general. We can never get tired, get tired of it. We might get a little weary in it. And that's why we need everybody. It's almost like staggered breathing when you're in a song, you can carry a note and sometimes you have to take a breath, but the song still goes on. That's exactly what, what we need to do. So thank you for allowing me the time to just share that um, and appreciate uh, uh, James of all of what you do and appreciate everybody you know, being on this call. You have to be here, be in the conversation to know kind of what's going on and what the next steps are. So much appreciative uh, to this conversation, looking forward to that continuing uh, to do good work and not grow and, and not grow weary in doing the good work. Indeed, and, and realistically, it's gonna be, uh, that's our job, right? You know, we see your energy, we see your passion and, and, and we're, we're happy to have you out there advocating on our behalf, but it's our job to keep you in, encouraged, right? That, you know, you don't just end your, your work on election day, you need to help support those people because the work is not, not easy. I mean, I, I know in recent months and in, in recent years, there have been, you know, significant um, uh, uh, elevation of conservative voices in our community who espouse racist ideals. And Wendy has to deal with that face to face uh, on, on a weekly basis. And um, it has to deal with it with poise and tact and, and you know, can't become the angry black woman. She's got to continue to do the work, right? So it, that's just the snapshot into to some of the things that, that, that are the realities uh, in, in our own community um, uh, and, and you know, should provide opportunities for allyship and action. So thank you. Um, so without further ado, now that we're, we're uh, 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 well in to 90 minutes of chit chat and having great talks. Um, I, I will point out and as we close up here that we will continue the conversation uh, for the next leg of the UCSB Arts uh, and Lectures Race and Justice series. The next event will actually be featuring um, Isabel Wilkerson, author of uh, CAST. Uh, she will be hosting, uh, will be doing her arts and lectures speech on uh, Tuesday January 26, and then we will unpack that with a Coffee with the Black Guy conversation on Thursday, uh, January 28th, starting at 7 p.m. Um, I hope to have flyers for that out momentarily so you can tell all your friends and help keep the conversation going. 
uh, I will encourage you to reach out. Some of you reached out in the, in the chat, but if there's things that you may personally have concerns with or something that came up or something you'd like to further discuss, uh, reach out. Uh, I, I don't, does that mean that I'm always able to respond immediately? But the goal is to kind of help create community here. And so if we can, if I can you know, respond and help point you in the right direction, that's my, my, my aim. Um, but also help connecting community members to, to, to make this thing that we call Santa Barbara community and greater uh, because it's always great to have folks from across the country joining us uh, as uh, uh, we have tonight. Uh, anything else, Casey, that I was supposed to, to highlight <laughs> that I forgot? You're spot on, James. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, in closing, uh, thank you all for joining. Thank you all the sponsors for uh, you know helping make sure that we keep these conversations going. Uh, feel free to reach out if you think that there's a way that we can be of assistance uh, in your place of work and organizations that you work with. Uh, this is a full-fledged consulting uh, company, but at the same time and at the root of what we do, it's about these community conversations and really making genuine connections with folks and giving, op giving opportunities to, to have authentic conversations beyond just trainings, beyond learning definitions, beyond role playing. Uh, we really need to figure out ways to implement these things in our in our daily lives. And so, you know, thank you to the UCSB Arts and Lectures for continuing to bring this this, this great talent uh, to to our community. Uh, thank you for the sponsors of that series. Um, and you know, let's keep the conversation going. Good night, Langston. You need to be in bed. <laughs>